I'm David Toop. I'm a musician and a writer. My relation with art and music is quite complicated, I think, because I studied as an art student, uh, but I, I dropped out of art school to become a musician. Uh, and I think that that beginning of, of being an art student continues to have a big effect on my life and, and the way things uh, evolve. Uh, but there's the additional complication that I'm a writer. So you always have that tension, I think, between um, being a performer, for example, and the more a analytical side of things, of, of being a writer. You know, trying to articulate... Um, what is going on in any situation, uh, dealing with histories, and at the same time as a performer, trying not to think too much about what you do. And that, uh, I don't know, there's a bridge for me, or, or there's a cut point, which is always in need of negotiation. Um, and always the feeling that uh, one activity shouldn't overpower the other in a way they should feed each other but the art thing is interesting I mean th these days I get asked to write m more about artists or or people I should say who are working in the gaps between different kinds of practices and I find that very interesting I find it very interesting to think about what I do as not embedded in one particular practice. I talk about fluidity of practice. So for example, thinking about how it's possible to um, go back to one of the activities which was important to me when I was a teenager, which is drawing, and think about the way in which that becomes part of my work as a somebody who works with sound and works with listening um, and similarly to think about the instrument the question of what an instrument is um, how does that connect with uh, non-physical manifestations you know like the way we think about ideas and how they translate into writing um, so yeah I, I mean it, it Really, it's, it's kind of a lifetime's investigation to work all of this, this stuff out. <laughs> so.
there is definitely work now that doesn't fit into any of the uh, institutionalized contexts. So maybe it fits best on YouTube or in just small gatherings of people that are almost secret. And I quite like that. You know, I like the fact that one is um, definitely a group of people in the know. But on the other hand, the other aspect of it is access can be completely random. So somebody in Thailand can come across it and think, oh, this is strange. What's this? Um, but that situation comes about partly because of the way um, distributing technology has developed, but also the way people work with sound or think about sound and listening, that has changed. So it moves away from straightforward music or straightforward art gallery stuff. Uh, that I find very interesting. One of the things that interests me is uh, formats um, and the thing I always say is, you know, there's no point in, um, if you don't think about the setting in which your work is created, then you're not really doing anything new or experimental. and working in the academy is an opportunity for me to actually experiment with formats in different ways and it's not done as a teaching thing i mean in a way i, d I don't think i do any teaching you know very often it's just setting up the conditions in which things happen and then uh, you kind of encourage people to think about how they can understand it better you know, so f for 12 years now I've done improvisation classes. I would say you can't teach improvisation. But you set up a situation in which people improvise without talking about it too much. And then you also set up a situation in which they can think about it and begin to comprehend what's going on. Um, it doesn't necessarily make them into good musicians, but um, it... I think they can learn a lot about how to work in groups, um, how to work cooperatively, how to analyze the dynamics of any given situation. So that to some degree is about formats, you know, and it's um, creating open, more open situations. <laughs>
To me, one of the great things about improvisation, free improvisation, is that um, you can understand more about yourself and other people as complex beings. You know, the idea of identity as being singular, I think, is wrong. You know, we're all complicated. We're all many people. You know, we're all... Um, culturally mixed and we're all men and women and we're all um, angry and passive and <laughs> you, you know we're all good people and bad people all at the same time and I think my feeling is that free improvisation allows you to be these different people according to who you're working with and uh, of course the same can apply f to them as well so each group has a very different character um, and to me it was very interesting when alterations reformed because there was a sudden realisation that oh I'm this person I'd forgotten about this person um, I can do all these things which I, I haven't felt free to do with anybody else but, you know, if I'm working with Rie Nakajima, I'm, I'm one person. But if I'm working with Sharon, I'm definitely another person. And I think the person working with Sharon is much more um, violent in a way. I, I, I mean, not physically... Well, yeah, physically violent towards the materials. Um, but a kind of violence in relation to silence. And... To me, that's very important. I mean, I, I I watch quite a lot of violent films. You know, I watch quite a lot of, for example, Japanese samurai films. <laughs> and, of course, if you watch a lot of things or you listen to a lot of things or you read a lot of things, you question yourself, why am I doing this, you know? Um, well, I can speculate about that, but I have to recognise that there is that part of me and improvisation kind of allows it in a fairly harmless way and I think the duo with Sharon um, is a place where that can happen and so the instruments I bring um, some of them are very much about vocalization because I like the way she uses her voice it's incredibly dramatic and expressive um, and I like to work with that but I also like to work with this very big dynamic range that the group has and there's a certain amount of crudeness I would say and a certain amount of almost blundering I'm talking about me I I'm not talking about her I think what she does in this duo is very precise um, and years ago that would have worried me but it doesn't worry me anymore. It's it's like, well, okay, that's just what happens and acceptance, you know? Not get too fussed about things, not, not get too neurotic about what you wanted to do and what wasn't quite right about it and, you know. So <laughs> when people talk about free improvisation, um... It's very misleading. But I think of it to, to some extent as, as being... having the personal freedom to allow these kind of things to happen.
It's a very typical situation with free improvisation that you play with people you don't know. Uh, so one minute you're playing with people who you've known for maybe 40 years and then the next someone you, you've never met. You don't know their name. You don't know who they are. They're just a stranger. And I think what that tells you about is the human capacity to adapt. You know, we do it easily in conversation. You're introduced to someone. He, you know, he is so-and-so, and you're into a conversation, and sometimes that conversation is good, and sometimes it's hopeless, it's terrible. It's the same with the music. Um, but you're discovering as you go. But then that is also typical of free improvisation, that you're kind of discovering the nature of the music and the way it's forming itself as it goes along. You, so you, it's a skill you acquire over years. And working with someone who's a complete stranger is part of that skill, I think. In a way, I mean, imp free improvisation isn't like tabula rasa. It's not blank slate every time. People pretend it is, but it's not. You have your habits, and everybody has their habits and their 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 strengths and their weaknesses and their skills and whatever. But in a way, what you hope is that the people you work with present some kind of new face every time, and you hope that of yourself. Of course, it doesn't always happen. But then, you know, that's true of any activity in life that you know sometimes it's there's innovation and sometimes there's repetition and redundancy and habit but um there's a strange feeling of getting an understanding of somebody very very quickly um through improvising in that way if they're a stranger um and sometimes it's uncanny. You know, you just, somebody can walk on, walk on, and you start playing, and you think, "Yeah, I, kn I know this person." It's, it's. I mean, maybe that happened with Sharon. You know, she said to me, "Will you play?" So the first, I mean, I'm not interested in rehearsing with anybody or trying anything out. You know, you just, you stand up in front of an audience and you get ready to make a fool of yourself, really. <laughs> and uh, particularly if it's somebody you'd never worked with, I mean, it could be terrible. But immediately you understand, okay, this is the character of this duo or this group or whatever it is and you act accordingly in the same way that you know you meet somebody and you might be kind of swearing and being you know <laughs> uh, and uh, some you meet somebody else and you'll be very polite and you know it's just the nature of human engagement not just with people, with any situation, with objects, with environments or whatever. Um, so um, it's one of the skills, I think, of free improvisation that is not often talked about. But I mean, to me, it should be talked about because it has extremely obvious extensions into human activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm.